Many women despise my independence, and too many men misunderstand my conduct. Small-minded people, yet abundant. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long, and I am Cole Rowling. Each episode of The Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. And I think that's especially important to note for this episode 82 because we're back to Cole's choice and he's got something brand new for us. Yes, I have chosen Sama from 2017, directed by Lucrecia Martel, and starring Daniel Jimenez Cacho, Lola Duenas, and Mateus Nastragal. It tells the story of Don Diego de Sama, an officer of the Spanish crown born in South America, who is waiting for a letter from the king granting him a transfer from the town in which he is stagnating. It is based on the 1956 novel of the same name by Antonio Di Benedetto. And you're right, I think it's a good idea to reiterate our spoiler warning, as this is such a recent release, and I imagine a lot of folks haven't seen it yet. We are going to cover this from beginning to end, so you may want to wait to listen until you've seen it. Fortunately, you won't have to wait long. Our friends at Strand Releasing are putting this out on DVD and Blu-ray on August 7th. It is definitely a title you will want to have in your library. I feel incredibly fortunate that we got to see this first on the big screen, and I'm sure that a lot of our listeners didn't have that opportunity. So the second you can get it, get it. Okay, on to the matter at hand. The long-awaited, at least for me, return of Lucrecia Martel. She is one of my absolute favorite directors. It's been 10 years since her last full-length feature, and almost 20, which seems impossible that it's been so long, since the film that brought her to my attention, La Cienega, which we covered in episode 25. Gosh, all the way back to episode 25. It doesn't seem that long ago. Yeah, it's been a while now. Well, like with all things Lucrecia Martel, this was certainly worth the wait. This was my single most anticipated film of the year, and it did not disappoint. I already knew I loved her work, but this was something altogether new, it felt like, in terms of scope and execution. All her familiar themes are there, class divisions, and all manner of decay, physical, emotional, moral, social... But against this backdrop of colonialism and politicking, they seem to take on a new gravity. A new resonance and depth is added with this sweep of history. And that's evident from the very first moments of the film. This first scene is a microcosm of the entire thing. We begin with the sounds of the natural world before we even have the visuals, and we open with Sama standing at the coast, surveying the sea and the horizon. Over the course of the film, we will come to figure out that he is always figuratively in this pose, longing for deliverance and frustrated by the lack of it. In this scene, he's the only figure in uniform, the only person fully dressed at all, really, among a group of natives. The first human sounds we hear are muffled laughter and conversation between some women villagers taking a mud bath naked, discussing predatory insects. In a voyeuristic moment, he watches them from the tall grass, and he's caught. They see him. They laugh at him and give chase, even. At first, he runs, humiliated. Initially seemingly at a disadvantage, he violently turns the tables, though, and attacks this woman, slapping her. It's something we don't see very often in film, someone fighting while naked. It's shocking any time it happens, but even more so here. It's an incredibly vulnerable feeling, especially with one person clothed and one not, and the gender dynamic. So in five minutes, we get everything. The desire for escape erotic longing, class and gender divides, colonialism and the subjugation of women, this man attempting to exert a measure of control over something, anything, and failing without even understanding how, all on a foundation of dreamlike unease. You mentioned that just about five minutes have gone by, and unfortunately for what you had just talked about, I have about 50 things that I (laughs) want to bring up. The first is that soundscape. It's Lucretia Martel's soundscapes that get me every time. It's the locusts and water lapping and children giggling. And then we see this man, and I can't tell, is he waiting? Is he observing something? 
If he's there as a monitor of some sort, what is it that he's monitoring? And then that moment that starts out with him being called a voyeur and one woman chasing him, my first instinct is to start to laugh. It feels quite funny. And then that instinct is turned on its head and it becomes something so different. It's a fascinating demonstration of character for me. Well, we next see him at his job. He's a magistrate, a functionary, and in his court, a young man is being tortured for a confession. The governor makes clear that for political advancement or to receive the benefit of certain considerations, Sama must achieve this confession. We quickly get the idea that even though he has considerably greater status than almost everyone he regularly interacts with, his existence is a parade of bowing and scraping. His obvious desire to get away from this place has left him with no leverage whatsoever. When it's evident that you'll sacrifice so much on the promise of this transfer, you have no whole card to play. He's not inept exactly, just neutered in so many ways. Do you think that's a fair assessment? How would you characterize his political skill? I do think that's an incredibly apt assessment. It feels like Sisyphus as well. I say that because everything about his appearance and his surroundings make these attempts at formality seem utterly ridiculous. It's his wig sitting on top of his dark hair that's not quite contained. It's the attempts to brush off squalor before you go into a government building while llamas surround you. He will never be able to achieve whatever he thinks it is he's supposed to achieve or has been told he must achieve. Well, we see him employ a little good cop, bad cop, late 18th century style, and this young man collapses on the floor and mutters this story of a fish that is rejected by the water, an obvious metaphor for Sama and the irony of his struggles, as well as colonialism. It's so striking, this parable of this fish fighting to and fro, because the water doesn't want it. It's attached to the very element that repels it. And when we see the image of these fish, to me they look like catfish. I don't know if they are or not, but what that signals to me is the bottom feeder feeding off the dregs. I hadn't thought specifically about the particular fish, but you are exactly right. That is a fantastic point, extending the metaphor even further. Well, all of that happens pre-credits. It's pretty dense. This film is loaded with things to examine and unfold. I read one reviewer describe it as being so dense that it would stop a bullet, and that is definitely on the money. I don't want that to be intimidating in any way. This is a very accessible film, but every single second of it seems rich and full with so much to discover. This, to me, also like La Cienega, is made for multiple viewings. And even though it is so incredibly dense, most of these scenes take moments. And I don't know about you, but that second viewing for me went by like lightning. It did. It seemed to pass in an hour instead of the two that it actually runs. Well, post-credit sequence here, we begin to meet some of the other characters, notably Fernandez the Scribe, who will compose this letter of Zama, his plea to the governor for a new post to leave this place. He also meets a trader known as the Oriental and his company on the beach who are bringing liquor ashore, among other things. I get the feeling that in this far-flung outpost, anything goes, and Sama confirms this in his own discreet way, everyone here is willing to do business. There's a distinct focus on Sama here during this conversation. The other voice comes from off screen and it underlines for me what a different experience this is from previous Martell films, having him at the center. Prior to this, her work was primarily matriarchal or centered on young women. Did this change affect how this felt to you? As opposed to something like La Cienega that is centered on multiple households of multiple generations of primarily women? I hadn't thought about it until you brought it up. I was just so excited to see another piece of her work. So I'm definitely not disappointed. I don't think that's the question you're asking necessarily. And this is such a fascinating character that it seems apt in her way to focus on. Well, the influence of women is clearly still strong, maybe just as strong, just more subtle. I only really thought about it in the sense that she made the right choice in casting him for the role. He communicates all the aspects of this character so well, the ambition, the hesitant impotence, the haunted befuddledness. I wrote down that it struck me that he looks like he's always trying to comprehend something. 
and is always falling short. That lack of comprehension on his part is easy to understand because it is in this procession of merchants coming ashore that the surreality, which will become a signature of the film, begins to surface. Significantly, we hear the first whispers of the name Vicuña, who is something of a boogeyman. In parallel to that, the Oriental son, almost in a trance, is recounting the myth of Sama himself. His tone is as if they are the only two people on earth, and yet he refers to Sama in the third person. I found one remark particularly cutting. His loneliness is atrocious. That is unsettling to both Sama and the audience, because it is so uncharitable in its assessment of him. We tend to think of loneliness as something we don't have a great deal of control over, and therefore are usually more sympathetic in our discussion of it. But the word atrocious is freighted with so much disgust and blame here. It's a small but potent semantic choice, just one more element that serves to keep us and Sama off balance. I'm almost forced to ask, is this an hallucination on Sama's part? Do you think this is actually happening? It's so dreamlike that I'm not entirely sure, even now. And the procession of these people so odd, I don't know what to quite make of it. There's also that sense with the arrival of the Oriental that they're bringing sickness with them. So it's quite possible that this odd child is even speaking in tongues, and yet this is what is coming out. I tend to take all of this at face value. I actually think this is taking place in Sama's actual real world. Now you mentioned the specter of this boogeyman, Vicuña Porto. And he's typically only referred to by his first name, which made me think, is that a name that we should generally know in terms of folklore? Like Cher or Elvis? (laughs) Exactly. So it turns out that Vicuña is a member of the camel family, very closely related to the alpaca and llama. So it makes me think of a person of this native land. So he's a bandit and a killer, and his exploits have become legendary. Somewhere, let's say, a cross between Jesse James and the Dread Pirate Roberts. And to give you some further context, we learn the title that Sama holds, which is Corregidor. This was a local administrative and judicial official sent from Spain to these colonies. The closest equivalent I think we have is probably Mayor. Is that fairly accurate? We don't have an exact one-to-one equivalent for this. We don't, and we don't still have maybe magistrates. But the important thing to note here for me is that by law, these people, including the governors, were not supposed to have resided in the district in which they ruled. This was so that they would not develop ties to the locals, so that they would remain disinterested. And we learn as we go along that, of course, this has not taken place. Because in reality, as we see in the film, these people became enmeshed in local society. Exactly. And that is evident in these scenes of his domestic life as well. They are just as puzzling. Just as filled with things that you glimpse out of the corner of your eye. Just one example, upon his initial arrival home, a naked man jumps from the window above and scurries away, disappearing almost into the woodwork. This is an inn where he lives. He chases after him to investigate, and it gives the impression that he is lashing out at ghosts, and it won't be the last time that we get that feeling. Are you hurt? He asks one of the three sisters that live there and tend to him, and he doesn't seem very worldly, or at least very attentive, asking this question. He thinks that this is valor, that he's protecting them, but if you observe the sisters not even all that closely, they clearly have little interest in being protected. They're looking forward to the return of this intruder, at least for now. We'll revisit this later when that changes somewhat. The reaction to this episode is telling, among the men at least. This will continually be referred to as a robbery, and I think that's an illuminating detail. It marks an immense shift away from Martel's usual matriarchal structure. No crime is described as being committed against these women, but against Sama. It forces us to ask what he was being robbed of. It isn't viewed as a violation of these women. Calling it a robbery instead frames them as property. And as you mentioned, there's that gender divide. Their father is very concerned that this bandit is going to come back because he's heard that Vicuña has been raping women. And even as one of the women is naked and Sama is reaching out to try to touch her, she is pushing him away very clearly for our eyes. 
Well, in contrast, we soon meet the most powerful woman in the film, as Sama attends a function. Doña Luciana Pinares de Luenga arrives, the treasury minister's wife, and she is striking. With her as the beguiling center of this universe, things start to get odd around the fringes. A doppelganger of this bald interloper pops up repeatedly. Word of the intruder has gotten around and has grown to become a rumor of Sama facing the notorious Vicuña. The Oriental and his cholera are a harbinger. During a bizarre ceremony, Pelos the doctor crumbles to the floor and they hiss Sama into silence. Only a little boy crawling on the floor through all their legs offers any help. Before it was just failure and frustration, but now the hint of death begins to insinuate itself into this narrative. For me, this gathering emphasizes how different the visual style of this film is compared to her other work. The distinct colors, the emphasis on bodies, doorways within doorways. There is still her trademark humid inertia, but the compositions aren't veiled the way they have been before. No rain-streaked windows, no windshields of cars between you and the action. For a period piece about Latin American 18th century politics, this is her most accessible effort so far, I think. It's more inviting visually, not as elliptical narratively. Not to say that it's next stop Marvel Cinematic Universe, but I think I'd recommend this as an introduction for viewers that are new to her work. And yet, I feel like Sama here because I don't know what's going on. I don't know context. I don't know if that's because I'm not familiar with the period or the area, or because she's deliberately keeping things elliptical for me. Because at first I wasn't sure, is he in a brothel? Is this just a society party that he's in as he goes past these women in high wigs who are completely ignoring him while there are horses inside the building? Ain't no party like an Asuncion party. <laughs> I think ultimately, I love that I don't know the answer. I know we're going to have some more of those questions come up as well. But it keeps me entirely off balance at all times, and I appreciate that. Unable to resist her allure, Sama goes to visit Luciana, and I love this character, and Lola Duenas adds such complexity to her. She wants so much more all the time. She has voracious appetites. She's lusty, prone to longing, prone to satiating that longing. She is trying so hard for elegance here. She can have anything she wants, but there is nothing she wants here. It's an exile for her, perhaps even more than Sama, I feel like. She laments that the wrapping of some glasses she had delivered from abroad carried more recent information than the colony's available newspapers. Sama speaks of his desire for a transfer, and he descends into sound as she is talking. She rouses him out of this reverie with boisterous applause. This woman is fascinating. And in equal measure, Sama's moves are clumsy and obvious. She knows exactly how easily she can manipulate him, and his failure to insinuate himself is apparent to everyone but him. He is so eager and so hungry here, but to me she is also incredibly obvious. And in any other setting would seem so gauche. Just further illustrating at what a disadvantage he is all the time with his desire to so desperately go away. She rebuffs his advances. Let's not be reckless, she says. Always egging him on, always teasing him. And we know that her husband, the treasury minister, is not there, nor is Sama's spouse. Spouses are never to be found. But everything takes place in front of these slaves, both men and women. I want to take a second and draw a little bit more of a line of demarcation here as far as these characters. I think in this context, it's more aptly described as servants because there are very definitely slaves and the difference between the two comes into play with Malimba herself. She is Luciana's ladies maid for lack of a better term and she is technically a free woman. It may be a small point, but I think the language is so important when it comes to Lucrecia Martel and so much of this is subtle and shades of gray. I know all of it is subjugation, but like everything else she does, there are these strata that are carefully observed and that there are distinct differences between. I'm so glad you brought up that point because I'm not entirely clear throughout who is who. We are specifically not told most of the time. And so we're trying to navigate this world in the same way. I think it's most important and to me most interesting here 
to realize that we don't hear their voices, except for a couple of occasions when we see those bewigged and becoded servants or slaves, native peoples, in loincloths who are allowed to be messengers. That's the only voice that we hear, and it's not really his own. He's delivering someone else's words. And it's as if they're almost castrated to a certain degree, how much they are, specifically the men even sublimated. Well, speaking of castration, I don't think Martell gets enough credit for her humor in this. It is so dry that it is arid, but it's there. It's just in a form that's hard for some viewers to recognize because we are so used to seeing these things employed in broad farce instead. The sexual teasing, Zama's continual snatching of defeat from the jaws of victory, even the Oriental's touch-and-go moment with his cholera-ravaged stomach. This film could easily be rewritten as a very effective comedy. Some sort of odd intersection between Don Quixote and Moliere? Yeah, it's practically Porky's. <laughs> Well, his frustrations are clearly mounting. Back at the magistrate's office, he meets with a family that has been sent to him to resolve a land dispute. They are clearly connected, but more importantly to Sama, they have a ravishing granddaughter. So he decides that he'll intercede on their behalf. It's a brief interaction, but there are a lot of layers here. How much of his response to her is just his general randiness? How much is his predatory nature looking to exploit this position that he's in to help them? She's of mixed blood significantly, so how much of this is him just looking upon her as something that he has a right to claim? What do you think the balance is of all these elements, or other things that I'm not even thinking of? Just that general institutional racism. Because these old people, these first comers, have killed all the Indians that sought to take back the claim to their land, which sadly for them leaves them with no workers. Sama disregards all of that and sides with this family, even as his assistant, Prieto, talks about how they have no documents. There's nothing that shows that they actually have any sort of a claim. And that leads to the larger argument about the crown and Spain and Indians and Vicuña again. Everything that Sama cannot seem to solve. To put in a little bit more context here as well, I thought it was really interesting that these farmers talk about their direct descendants from Domingo Martinez de Aralia. That was the first Sama almost to come over, a conquistador, who set about to do his job in the 1500s, ruling forcefully, and that means subjugating the entire native population, building towns, starting these colonies that would then bring us to the point that we are in these late 1700s. So now that we know that, when you hear those words, when you hear that name, you have to think, this is hundreds of years of bloodshed, and Sama is just continuing the tradition. Much like everyone else Sama runs across, Prieto is more sensitive and nuanced than he is. He is skeptical of Sama's motives. He's pragmatic. He's not horny. And this leads to that argument that you referred to. Class issues arise again. Sama's ineffectuality rears its head again. He is not a man who is taken very seriously by anyone, and his frustration at that and everything else boils over, and this argument turns into a brawl. In the aftermath of this fight, the sisters help him undress and bathe, and in the process, he discovers that one of them has been bitten. Humiliated, is how she puts it, by this intruder that returned to have his way with her. Now she seems sincere in her desire for vengeance, after it turned out to not be the encounter she wanted. Her response seems thorny to me and maybe disproportionate. I'm not saying that by inviting his return she was in any way asking for or deserving of violence, but I know that Lucrecia Martel is never so obvious or easy to pin down. What do we do with this? Considering her anticipation of his visit has now swung all the way over into asking Sama to kill him, saying you have nothing to lose. I think that's a fascinating question. I'm so glad you asked it. You asked it of me when we had finished watching it, and I wanted you to ask it again now. And I'll say the same thing that I did then, which is that I don't have to do anything with it. And I know that you, Cole, my husband, knows that I'm not being combative when I say that. It's the sense that these sisters, and Luciana, and Malemba, and any of the other native women, I don't 
have to pin down their motivations or apologize for them or explain them. I certainly don't have to do it with the male characters. So as you mentioned, why can't they be as thorny and complicated and crazy and interesting and weird and wrong as anyone else? I think that's entirely the point, and I love it. In this exchange, she also delivers news of a death. And a visit to the crypt reveals that the Oriental's cholera has overtaken him once and for all. There's a line in this scene that I love. Death imposes conditions on all of us. We haven't spent much time on this aspect of it so far, but I wanted to note here how much poetry is truly in this screenplay. It's not overly florid, and it doesn't call attention to itself, but there are a number of points at which I found myself marveling at how succinctly a lovely phrase was turned. So often it has that effect of being a simple sentiment, but put in a way that you have never quite thought about before. I think what's interesting there as well is that the burial must be paid for. I like that we have that intrusion of financial matters. That is day-to-day life there. And Sama, Mr. Compassion that he is, says do it cheaply. In his ongoing effort to keep expenses low, he delivers the news of the Oriental's death to Luciana and suggests that any remembrance should be austere. Her response? Boring. I love this particular scene because without being ostentatious about it, Martel manages to bring the film around to the things that we might usually be looking to her to address. Luciana demonstrates that she is acutely, painfully aware of both the benefit and cost of her own flesh. We discover that Malimba is not mute, but her feet were damaged by slave traders. Malimba's wedding is discussed along with the approval that would need to be secured to have it. So much of this conversation centers on women, their bodies, their sovereignty. Martel is subtly and expertly detailing how within all these social strata, being a woman is also a separate class unto itself. Unless I'm just reading it entirely wrong. What did you take away from this? No, absolutely the same thing. This discussion of her marriage, Malimba's marriage, is not her choice. The decision will be made for her the permission and agency will be granted for her. We never hear her words, her thoughts on it. It's done in front of her as if she's a child, all in that vomit-inducing, coquettish way that Luciana has, that she's perfected. How much of the development of that personality, though, do you feel like is self-preservation? How much of it is a device that she needs to survive and thrive? Can you fault her for it? I can. (laughs) Okay. I think you're giving her more credit. I think that she's truly almost this 18th century Moliere invention. Maybe she's just seduced me as completely as everyone else. It could be. Because isn't it such a hilarious joke that Malimba's feet were skinned, that she swam for hours, for days to get away from these traitors? But what's important is that all men want to covet her body. I probably don't need to clarify this, but I will just in case. It's a stellar performance. This is a fascinating character. The film would not be the same without her. Well, we have a message from the governor. Mail has arrived. Finally, perhaps there is good news. And cue a horse being put down in the courtyard at that exact moment. Another harbinger. Seriously, Martel has brilliant comic instincts. These subdued bits of dark discomfort would be the best jokes in any number of other movies. It's punctuated throughout by these oddly comic moments of absurdity, like this inquisitive llama that we will soon meet, eavesdropping on this pivotal moment in his life. There's not much question as to how this meeting is going to go. There's no news for Sama. Well, it's not exactly true. There's plenty of news. The kicker is that Prieto, because of this brawl, is being deported. However, essentially that deportation is a transfer to a place that he wants to go and that Sama wants to go. It's not just a transfer, a transfer with a recommendation. It also turns out that the governor is being transferred. It's like Oprah's up in this joint. You get a transfer, you get a transfer. It could have been worse, I guess. Sama's rank saved him from punishment or censure. This time, sort of. As a reward, he receives more tedious work, and he finds himself descending again. I wanted to talk here for a minute about one specific piece of the sound design. Right at the top, you talked about how, as usual with her films, the sound design is every bit as compelling and indispensable as the imagery. Using nature sounds, chimes, bells, the sound of children's toys, 
but there's a new element in it this time, and that is the use of the shepherd tone. By this point in the film, it's happened a couple of times now, and you will know exactly what I mean when you hear it. When it occurs, it feels almost like hypnosis, drawing you further and further down Sama's spiral. It really is a nifty aural illusion, and the way it works is fascinating. It's named after the cognitive scientist Roger Shepard, and musicians, composers, and sound designers probably know what I'm talking about, but to the layperson, this might be a new piece of information. Was this something that you were familiar with? Not at all. I had never heard the term shepherd tone, had no idea what it was. And now that you've shown it to me, it's totally fascinating. The simple explanation of how it works is that you generate three musical lines. One high, one in the middle, one low, all an octave apart. All ascending or descending along the same scale. By increasing the volume of the highest octave line and decreasing the volume of the lowest, you create this illusion of a sound that is infinitely rising or falling without ever actually getting higher or lower. It's a very specific type of disorienting and unnerving because it literally never achieves resolution to your ear. It's almost a sick feeling when paired with how increasingly bereft of hope Sama is. Take a minute and Google shepherd tone and go down that rabbit hole. You'll be glad you did. It's a really neat trick. You mentioned hypnosis. It's almost to me like he's going into a fugue state. And if we had seen him pass out, that's the feeling that I get. I must have encountered this elsewhere. Are there other examples that you can think of off the top of your head? Oh, I guarantee you have. Hans Zimmer uses it quite a bit. You'll see it in Christopher Nolan films from time to time. It's one of those things like the Wilhelm scream that once you know what it is, you'll hear it all over the place. Speaking of bereft of hope, Sama is adrift. He finds no relief when he returns to Luciana's. She is indisposed, if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah, she's getting busy with Prieto, and therefore Sama does not get announced. So he goes about busying himself with work and other duties, and in the course of him casting about for mooring, we learn that Sama has sired an illegitimate child with one of the native women, and there's an interesting power dynamic there that leaves me with a lot of questions. I asked the question earlier about the colonizer viewing the native women as property that they have the right to claim. Judging from his interactions with this woman, though, I was curious if you think that's accurate and what you imagine this relationship to be. For example, he brings them that absurd bed that they soon repurpose, and he is looking for some sort of help or connection, but receives absolutely none. She seems decidedly unconcerned with his wants or demands, and that is putting it mildly. She actually behaves as if she has nothing to lose, as if there's nothing that he could say or do that could hurt her. I think of it more that he has absolutely nothing that he could possibly give her of value. And I don't mean to cast the natives in some sort of magical light. I'm trying to think of everyone as a whole, and especially in the time period as well, trying to navigate what is quote-unquote proper, what would be dictated to you by the church, what would be dictated to you in the absence of any sort of church, what people truly want or desire, and what they can express within the confines of this society. We talked about the sisters earlier, having an idea of what you want and the reality not necessarily living up to it for a number of reasons. No one goes through this life completely as an island. Every choice affects someone else, and everyone else's choices affect them. So it seems to me to be this ridiculous mishmash of society as a whole played out on all of these strata that you've mentioned. Some people, like this woman with whom he has had this child, are just more realistic and self-assured, possibly. Self-assured is definitely how I would describe this new governor that arrives, not necessarily realistic. And Sama makes his initial visit to him to perhaps foster this relationship that might get this letter of transfer underway. The governor claims he has the ears of the Cunha Porto as a grisly trophy. We see them draped around his neck. This is a vastly different man from his predecessor. Similarly ambitious, perhaps, but in a dumb cruel, reactionary, anti-intellectual way. I think he, like so many of the other characters, hears what he wants to believe. Vicuña at different points has been executed, taken care of. 
years have passed and he's clearly still out there. I don't think anybody else truly believes that those are his ears. Yet it's what's convenient. Sama appeals to him about this letter to the king for his transfer, but before they can get to the dictation, they discover that the scribe Fernandez is writing a book. This is trouble. To imbeciles, a book is dangerous. So close and yet so far again, no letter. He's been managing to cling to some small shred of hope until now, but this is the event that begins Sama's decline in earnest. And this new residence that the governor moves him into is the beginning of the end. I'll only stay a few days, he says. Sure, buddy. Residence is the kindest word I could (laughs) ever think of for this. This house is both insult and injury. The porters won't go there. Unseen voices tell him that no one enters this house. No one serves him here. It seems that there is death all around. He is seeing ghosts. He falls ill with a terrible fever. Meanwhile, at work, the governor is rearranging things as well. Functionary was never a more appropriate title for someone. He is banking everything on this letter more so than ever. I thought he might not survive this. I wondered at first because I wasn't sure if those were ghosts or if he was maybe losing his mind. Especially, as you mentioned, in these surroundings. In the office, everything is rotting away. Literally, everything is making him sick. What I loved here was that everything he has, including the clothes on his back, must be burned. Because everything is diseased. As he is suffering with this sickness, the governor reminds him, no report on the book, no letter. So he eventually turns one in. The governor is very pleased at its ruthlessness. And so Sama feels like, here's my opening. He asks about the letter. The response? What letter? The sickening formality here is that we write the first letter now, and then the second letter follows in a year or two. That's just how we must observe these formalities. It feels like a death sentence. When I heard that, even though I knew it had to be coming, my heart just dropped. Even though I feel no affection for this man, even though his dignity is feigned and empty and he's not particularly honorable, did you have a similar reaction? I think I felt something more along the lines of, of course. Of course he wouldn't know. Of course this would be the process. I haven't felt sorry for him at any point. I think the whole idea of seeking out this post was for power, and this is the emptiness that comes with it. For me, there's just enough of the underdog, perhaps, in being that man without a country that I feel at least some sympathy for him. He has no true friend, ally, or authority with either the colonized or the colonizers. But he never completely quits, which I admire to some degree. You can also chalk some of this up to the appeal of Daniel Jimenez Cacho. That face, definitely. I think you've come out firmly on the side of Sama and Luciana throughout this, so... You can't redeem those sentiments at this point. Do I need to pull an Eric along and state on the record that both colonizers and Nazis are just no good? Thank you, sir. So basically, Sama's response to this is, fuck all y'all. He knows this transfer is never going to happen, and he takes to the wilderness, metaphorically speaking, because he actually goes nowhere. Years pass, and he volunteers for a dangerous mission, the goal of which is to eradicate Vicuña Porto for good to encourage trade by eliminating thieves and cleaning up the trade routes. The promise of the transfer is still dangling there bitterly after all these years, and this is the key, the head of Vicuña Porto, the head of the devil himself. I'm going to put volunteering heavily in quotation marks (laughs) for a couple of reasons. I don't think that he truly thinks the transfer is ever going to take place, and at the same time, he has nothing to lose, so who cares? This expedition sets out, and it is not long before they discover a corpse wrapped up in straw in a tree. No jokes this time. We have entered the deadly serious part of the program. The group is similarly asleep up in the trees when natives come, migrating, blind and whistling, taking their horses. There's more of this poetry that I love as they discuss what are essentially these living ghosts. In talking about the elders of the tribe, it said... They walk fast so as not to disappoint their children. Man, there are at least half a dozen lines in this thing that I wish I had written. I only usually think that when I'm watching Tom Stoppard. This man, who has been sort of his guide to these blind Indians, reveals himself. And it is, drumroll, Vicuña Porto himself. 
I felt like the blood drained from my face at that moment. This man is so small and terrifying and effete and charming and sprightly. It's as if Truman Capote and Gollum got together to create this character. Matthias Nostragal here, who plays Vicuña Porto, is enthralling. By far, even though we've mentioned two stellar performances, my favorite performance. I can't look away from him. I don't want to look away from him. And everything about his body language, his movement, is repulsive. It's truly stunning. Yes, you are on the money. He does this with such impish glee. And I think the most terrifying thing to me is that he fairly radiates with unpredictability. He's brandishing Zama's own sword at him, telling him this story. Do you believe him? Is the name just a symbol? I assumed so, especially once I learned of the animal origin of the name. I figured it was something that he had come up with himself. I love that moment where he sort of punches Sama in the arm, even though he's practically a foot shorter than him. I wanted to fall off the couch. Well, he bullies and threatens Sama into silence. And this is one of the biggest lingering questions I have about the film. Why did he reveal himself? Why right here, right now? Why in this way? I think he is so pleased with himself that he can't keep it in. He doesn't want to keep it in. And there's no need for him to keep it in. They're in this swamp. Nothing's going to happen. He cannot possibly be taken. So who cares? Rub it in his face. Well, as they're making their way through this swamp, they are accosted by some masked natives. And Vicuña might be a demon, but even he knows when the odds are not in his favor. They lose their last horse to them, and battle ensues with them. It's not much of a battle, honestly. They are snared and rounded up with seemingly little effort. They are bathed and painted red for this celebration. A celebration of their impending murder, it feels like to me. But then they're unceremoniously dumped back where they were taken from, and their horse is returned. Significantly, Vicuña has appropriately retained this diabolical coloring. Again, there's another moment coming up here that I love. As they're trying to get some fish, Porto has his hands out and his chest puffed out and he's smiling at us. I don't have anything else to say. I just want people to see it. As we enter the home stretch here, I want to talk about another element that we haven't spent much time on, and that's Martel's composition. Because we have one of my favorite examples of it here with Vicuña and his band of brigands asleep, him on top of their horse and the rest of them all around it as they are lying on the beach. It's a beautiful image, and everywhere in the frame there is something interesting to look at. It's so serene and yet simultaneously dreadful. And just to be clear, he's not astride the horse. The horse is lying down on the beach, and he's lying on top of it. And this excellent composition doesn't just apply to what's on screen either. Throughout the film, there are instances in which she uses the off-screen space just as effectively as what you see through the viewfinder. Were there specific frames to you that stood out? Before I answer that question, I do want to mention that that idea of things happening off screen, I'm looking in a different direction, can often really annoy me. There are specific filmmakers that utilize that and I despise it. This is not that instance. It's not distraction. It's using every part of the world. And it's not affectation. It's a character device. It's a story device. It's me catching up to something that I should have noticed in the first place. But to answer your question, I feel like I really missed the boat, even though this was my second viewing, on capturing those elements of imagery and composition. I know at my subconscious level that I did see them, I did notice them, I did register them. But I feel a little bit at a disadvantage, especially with watching foreign language films for this podcast, because I'm spending so much time trying to make sure I'm capturing the dialogue and taking my notes and following what's happening. So when we come back to watch this purely for pleasure viewing, I think that's when I'll make more specific observations about that. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I think you probably have examples of your own favorites that you are now so intimate with that this is not a problem. I think about something like Wings of Desire, where I know it so well at this point that I can just let myself fall into it and watch. Once again, we have Vicuña's desire to confess or explain himself to Sama. And I think your reasoning is absolutely correct. Evil can't exist in a vacuum. 
It needs a victim to exploit. It needs an audience. Yeah, I think it's gloating, not confession. He is Porto, and yet Porto is not him. It's no one. It's a name. It's an idea. It's a tool. He leads Sama into the water and slithers all around him, leering and grinning, explaining his plan. He wants what he calls the coconuts, the jewels in the rocks. They're geodes that he's read about, not knowing that they are worthless. They think Sama knows their location, and that's why they brought him. That's why he's still alive. The implication to me here is that information from Fernandez's book was somehow disseminated, and like everything else in the orbit of Vicuña, it has become distorted and amplified. It's yet another cruel irony that Sama didn't actively suppress or destroy this thing when he was afforded the opportunity. The governor, in his pig-headed reactionary ignorance was right after all. The book was dangerous. I think that's a totally reasonable interpretation to make. It's not something that we know for sure, at least in the film's context. Another could be, as you mentioned, the governor had presented one of these earlier and was told by Sama that it's worthless, but there were plenty of other people around. Porto and his men could have infiltrated without even having to infiltrate anything every layer within the government. It could have been another functionary that told them about it. They could have witnessed it themselves. Who knows? There is so much delicious irony laced throughout this thing that I cannot get away from the idea that it was somehow Sama that did this to himself. He delivers one last perfect poetic line here that both disabuses this band of the notion that this is treasure worth seeking and he also finally acknowledges aloud the fruitless void of his own life. I do for you what no one did for me. I say no to your hopes. Oh, that is so brilliant. I wonder if that is taken straight from the novel. I really do want to read this book, because if a lot of this dialogue is transferred directly from the text, the book has to be wonderful. Lucretia Martel herself adapted the novel for the film. In response to this, they mutilate him. They chop off his hands and abandon him, telling him to shove his stumps in the sand to stop the bleeding, and he might survive. It is barbaric. And, just as suddenly, in this coda, he is adrift, ruined but still alive, degraded more than I am sure he ever thought possible when this all began. The indignity of not receiving a timely transfer is a much preferable. Or is it, do you think? Or is that even the question to ask here? Just like the opening scene, everything that's crucial about this story is all present right here in this last five minutes. Martel's rigorous composition, the haunted futility, the notion that this thing that you have been fighting for so long is just your destiny. And there's no love in it whatsoever, but that does not mean that you are any less intertwined. In this native boat, on this water, covered in green flora, impossible greenness. It's a child who asks him if he wants to live. And he doesn't respond. He's born out of sight on this boat to continue meeting his fate again and again. Man, this is a good movie. Thanks again to our friends at Strand Releasing for getting this one to us. Once again, the home video release will be available on August 7th. This one is a must-own day one purchase for me. How about a must-own day-one purchase recommendation? What do you have for us? Well, because this film was so buoyant, I was looking for something else that gave me that same sense of dreadful inevitability. (laughs) And while the film that I'm about to recommend is set during a period that to my mind now seems endless, at that time, one might have hoped that prosperity was just around the next bend and that with a chance you could make it. So I chose They Shoot Horses, Don't They? from 1969, directed by Sidney Pollack, with Jane Fonda, Michael Sarazen, Susanna York, and Gig Young. I still have not seen this one. Really? I think that I saw this on a VHS copy from a library rental years ago. Thank you to our nation's libraries. I've watched many wonderful things through those rentals. This film is set during the Great Depression, in the early 30s, centered around a dance marathon that was a craze of the time. Jane Fonda plays an aspiring actress who is recovering from a suicide attempt. She's gotten the idea to try to make it in Hollywood. 
Michael Sarazen plays an aspiring director, and together they decide to enter this dance marathon. Gig Young is essentially the Vicuña Porto of this. <laughs> this is a grueling exercise that takes its toll on everyone. As Jane Fonda's character Gloria is begging Robert to kill her because her life is hopeless. I'm going to leave it at that point since you haven't seen it yet. And probably a lot of other people haven't as well. How about you? You mentioned Porky's earlier. Is that your <laughs> recommendation? No. I decided to stick with colonialism and up the ante on the madness, and I have chosen Aguirre, the Wrath of God from 1972, directed by Werner Herzog and starring Klaus Kinski. You dirty dog, because that was one of the four recommendations I was narrowing my choice down to. Well, it would have been a really good one, but I beat you to it. <laughs> this is a masterpiece. One of these days, we will do a full-length episode on this and a number of other Herzog films. But for now, take this recommendation, go and immediately watch this while you are waiting on Sama to become available. Like Sama, this is a historical drama, but of the more epic adventure variety. It's about a Spanish soldier leading a group of conquistadors down the Orinoco and Amazon rivers in search of El Dorado, the mythical lost city of gold. Take everything that is subtle and subdued about Sama and turn it inside out. What Daniel Jimenez Cacho experiences internally, Klaus Kinski turns into a weapon and uses it to cut a wide swath through the unforgiving jungle. He is both Sama and Vicuña Porto all rolled into one. We see some of these same themes on display, the simmering resentment between the conquered and the conqueror, spiritual and mental decay, pursuits whose futility is only matched by their ceaselessness. But Herzog and Kinski are frenzied in a way that Martel is not. Even so, these men end up in similar circumstances. Adrift, mocked by cruel fate, it is one of the great films of world cinema. See it. So once again, that's two great recommendations. They shoot horses, don't they? And Aguirre, the wrath of God. And that brings us to the end of episode 82. First and foremost, we want to thank the folks that have joined the ranks of our Patreon supporters. Will Kaur and Carla Shiflett, thank you both very much. We appreciate it. Carla hosts a radio show that I highly recommend you check out on KOOP Radio. It's called Crate Diggers Gold, and it's on every Wednesday from 4.30 to 6, with a focus on some of the best funk, soul, and R&B 45s you might have never heard. 91.7 FM if you are in Austin, and KOOP.org if you want to listen online. It's a huge highlight of my drives home on Wednesdays. And while you are online checking out Carla's radio show, be sure to go over and take a look at our Patreon at patreon.com slash magiclantern if you would like to join their esteemed company. If you pledge at the $5 a month level, that gets you access to bonus episodes, so you will never have to go a week without new Magic Lantern in your life. And any time you join, you can check out our backlog, including our MST3K episode, our Saving Brenton episode. Yes, there are 30 of those episodes, soon to be more. They come out alternately to our regular episodes, so we're adding more all the time. If you would like to just get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Instagram, where you can mostly see pictures of our dog, Gibson. And we are on Facebook and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast in any of those venues. We are on Twitter, at Lantern underscore cast. And I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Andy Wolverton, Jane Sankner, the fine gentleman of Fuds on Film, Tim Lego, John Laubinger, Jan Willis, Travis Trudell, Brian Sauer, Keith Rich, Matt Gasteyer, and William Hansen. And I wanted to say a special thanks to Andrew Sherburn, Mike Zaws, Kathy fuller Seely, and everyone who was associated with the film Saving Brenton for all the great feedback about our Patreon bonus episode about the movie. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, and now we're on Spotify. That's very exciting. Just about anywhere you get your podcast, you can find us there. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate it. Seth Seppla left us a review this time around, and it was very nice. Thank you very much for that, Seth. In our last episode, we mentioned that Hunter Wolf was kind enough to do that for us, and so we'd like to return the favor and spread the word about Hunter's film podcast as well. 
It's called Overexposed, and here is Hunter to tell you a little more about it. The Overexposed Podcast. Every one of you listening to this, look out, because soon, very soon, the most entertaining movie podcast ever conceived will be ravaging your senses. Run, don't walk, to the Overexposed Podcast. It downloads, it streams, it eats you alive! It's unstoppable. The hysteria sweeps one city, and before long the nation, and then the world can fall beneath the crippling entertainment of the Overexposed Podcast. And that's a wrap. New episodes every Monday, wherever podcasts can be found. The Overexposed Podcast. Oh my god, that scared me. And we have one big bit of news this time. The third anniversary of the podcast is coming up. And to celebrate, we booked a nice big screening room and are throwing a movie party. So, if you are in Austin and free on Friday, August 10th, we hope you can make it out to meet us. We are showing one of our favorite giallos, The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward. Festivities will take place at Austin Public at 1143 Northwestern Avenue. And we will start at 730 and there will be cake. And you can find details on our Facebook page and in our Facebook group as well. Specifically, you should go to the Magic Lantern podcast group on Facebook because that's where the event page is. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at our website, magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. 